So, Robert Ellswit, you are the cinematographer on Roman J. Israel Esquire. Uh, one of the great qualities of this movie is the way that it captures the city of Los Angeles and really uses it as a character. Can you talk a bit about how you guys uh, shot in Los Angeles and captured the spirit of the city in this movie? I think it's something that's very important to Dan Gilroy, writer-director, as it was on um, uh, Nightcrawler, uh, and very different from Nightcrawler. It, when we started Nightcrawler, he, he was adamant about not making a downtown LA movie, that he wanted the city to feel like the character lived in a kind of ribbon of highways. That is, except for the short periods of time when he was in his tiny little apartment, he was on the road. And the roads are what connects the city. And he was going to be West Hollywood, the valley, travel through the mountains to get back and forth between the two, but always traveling, always on the road, freeways, highways, all the city streets. And that was the Los Angeles that Dan wanted in that movie. And the Los Angeles he wanted in this movie, because it was a character, in the way you describe, a reflection of Denzel's character in the sense that most of what was part of Denzel's life and what LA was 30, 40, 50 years ago is slowly being erased. It's all being torn down in a way that it never has before. There's always been revival. There's always been a little bit of uh, a hopeful revival of downtown Los Angeles over the years, but it's never succeeded in the way it succeeded in the last few years. Everything that's old is being torn down. And Daniel wanted to show that starting with next door to Denzel's apartment, his character's apartment, there'd be a high rise being built, condo, five or six story condo. And that outside the windows and all the locations that we tried to pick for the movie, you'd see construction work going on. Um, I think if we'd had more money and more time, we might've even gotten into showing a little bit of demolition. But just the idea that the city is just under renewal and that what's old is slowly disappearing. And that, I think, is the closest thing I could accept to being a metaphor for, uh, for Roman Israel, for who he is and what he is in the movie. He's someone who lives in the past, somebody whose past is really irrelevant now and is slowly being erased in every way. All his memories, everything that's on the wall in his apartment, all these people are either dead or dying or irrelevant. And much of Los Angeles is changing as dramatically as you could possibly imagine. And he no longer feels at home and his own home. So that was the Los Angeles Dan wanted. He wanted a downtown that's forever changing. The Criminal Courts building, which is pretty much the same as it's been since the 1970s, but that where he worked in his partner's law office all his career prior to when the movie starts, and everything after that would be a real contrast to the world of his own apartment, the original offices he worked in, uh, the, the the small little world that was his. And that's what Dan set out. That's what we tried to do. So that there would be in Colin Farrell's all office, in the prison that he goes to off and on, in the courtrooms that he visits, really for the first time. His character has never really gone to court before or hasn't gone in years. And he's certainly never interviewed clients in the city jail. He's never done any of this stuff, say, since the 1970s. So that world is new to him, even though he's worked in criminal law all his life. So that was what the contrast that Dan wanted, and also a real look at Los Angeles going through this transition from a kind of old beat up quality of the old part of town into these modern sky rise, uh, skyscraper, high rise condos and office buildings that are going up all over the city, replacing the, the downtown that Denzel's character was familiar with. You mentioned his character, and I mean, the, the film is first and foremost a character study, and, and it all really relies on him. Can you talk about um, uh, some of the visual techniques you used uh, just from a, a craft standpoint in order to show the world through his eyes? You know, I, I'm not sure we, we, in all honesty, we really try to do it as straightforward as possible. And I think the one small thing we did, which was out of the ordinary or sort of slightly unusual, is because Denzel is such an expressive actor. Most of the time, we're really just trying to record what he does, that he is so in the moment and so present and so almost unaware of what he's doing. And I mean that in the best possible way. As an actor, he's not acting. His behavior is 
is so original and so unusual and so different take to take to take that we found ourselves photographing him despite our original intention in a much more uh, intentions in, in a much more straightforward way we really just covered what he did in ways that allowed him the most freedom and i think the only thing we did a little different was occasionally in certain moments in the movie we found ways because he's such an expressive actor of not really seeing him all that well of shooting it from the side from the back three-quarter profile and maybe be only seeing one eye or seeing the back of his head or seeing something that wasn't a dead-on straightforward presentational view of roman that was just an interior model that suggested there was some sort of interior life that wasn't in existence that that what he was thinking had nothing to do with what he was saying or what the scene might necessarily be about in a sort of obvious direct way that his world was happening in a in, and, and that he's a he's a guy sort of on the asperger's sort of sliding scale a little bit so there is an internal monologue that's going on that happens at home it happens when he listens to records and it happens when he's under enormous stress so we found that a few times i often wish we'd found it a few more times but it's not really we weren't really going out there very far it's a very straightforward um almost sydney lament like look i think i hope i mean that's paying it a lot of compliment but a look at a character who's trying to find his way through this sort of remarkable journey that he's on you bring up Sidney Lament, and I was going to say, I mean, that uh, the film shares a lot of qualities with those kind of gritty, um, even though his movies mostly <laughs> took place in New York, but that kind of street realism of movies from the 70s, early 80s. Um, it's true. Yeah. I from think what I have, yeah, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was just saying that's the kind of movie we were, I was just talking about this the other day with Dan. We were talking to some other people about it, and it's absolutely true. Dan's references what the movies Dan fell in love with were those movies of the 70s and the 80s most of them made in New York I'm thinking of you know Sidney Lamad, Sidney Pollack, Alan Pakula, uh, Billy Friedkin um, all, all the films that grew out of that you know the city as character what we think of as New York especially unique to New York because it's not easy to do but it's easier to do the, char the city has so much character it's almost if you if you really try it's even impossible if you don't try it's hard to avoid it because it's such a a presence in every location you go to and that's something that danny loves and also he makes movies in the present day they're realistic basically um they take place in the real world um that's something that appeals to him enormously and so he was very happy and very um very engaged in trying to make it feel like you know there's only there's not really any sets in the movie they're little partial sets but everything we're doing is very much like a little bit or a lot of Sidney Lumet in that we're on location, we're shooting in real places. A lot of the people you see in the background aren't extras. They're real people. Um, not always, but sometimes. And we're playing the city, uh, again, as you say, as character. Walk down the street and there's a couple of places where Denzel with long lenses, he's on the phone, he's walking across, he's going in various places. And no one recognized him because this his hair and his, his, his put on, he put on a little weight for the part, he's wearing glasses, he's dressed in sort of an eccentric way, and he wasn't recognized. So we found it was actually possible to walk him through parts of LA in certain parts of the scene, in certain parts of the movie, where no one saw who he was. And it was safe enough that we, he, he really does, with a few extras around him, disappear in a crowd. And that was kind of fun. I hadn't done that in a long time, especially with a, a major movie star. You just can't do that. You can't have George Clooney walk down a city street uh, in downtown LA. Oh, I suppose you could, but you'd probably pay a big price for it. So that was kind of, that's what Danny's interests were. And we, I think we're able to do it for the most part. I think we did a pretty good job with it. You also captured the city at night uh, really well in a lot of key scenes. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I think it was the one time we shot motion picture film for most of the movie, but the one place that for budget and, and uh, schedule reasons, it's easier to shoot at night. And uh, it's certainly like uh, in the way that we did on the Nightcrawler as well, when I don't have to do a lot of lighting. And there was a few places where at night it was just going to be impossible for us to carry all the backgrounds. If we didn't just, if we didn't shoot digital, it's faster. Um, the, uh, so it's like having a faster stock. 
And um, the downtown locations we picked as a nightcrawler, I picked because the backgrounds were already lit enough that all I had to do was light the foreground. I would just be able to sort of augment what was already there and then manage to pace the, the foreground, just sort of uh, make sure that I wasn't over lighting it so that it felt like it was part of what was really going on that you saw behind. The one big exception was there's a, a mugging on Angel's flight and I had enough control uh, at that location because we had to light almost all of it anyway, that we ended up shooting that on film. But a couple of other major night sequences, including walking through downtown LA, that long walk down Broadway, that ends uh, in the end of the movie, where Denzel is, is being followed and chased. Um, that was digital as well. The steady cam shots and pieces like that. This is no way on our budget, um, our schedule to be able to light the city streets in both directions like that. So, but aside from that, we shot motion picture film for almost all of it. What was the most difficult scene for you guys to shoot, either from a, a standpoint of um, it was technically difficult or you just had a hard time figuring out how to, how to cover it visually? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, the, the hardest scene to do, I mean, creatively, I, I'm not sure we had a real problem figuring out. We had real, we, we planned it pretty carefully how to do everything. And I think the most challenging part of it was to be able to, to figure out ways of shooting Denzel that didn't interfere with this process. And there were a few times when, and I think that, I mean, he'd be the first to say it, he's very in the moment and, and, and many times unaware of what he's doing physically and when. So that there's issues with, if you're seeing a single camera show, it's oftentimes difficult to find the same, not just the same performance, but the same physical actions to create, then they create matching problems if you don't do it right. And in a strange way, one of the things we, I think, early on had to figure out a way to do shooting single camera was be able to stage the scenes and figure out the coverage so that we weren't, so that we could use whatever, whatever Dan loved of what Denzel did and not be forced out of shots for matching reasons. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's a little bit of a technical challenge. And he is, he had, all this jargon to say in this movie. He had all this junk that he had to say that, that there were stories he was telling and he was, although he was interacting with characters, he was doing exposition. He was doing all sorts of things that don't come naturally and are difficult for actors anyway. And he had pages of it. And so he would go up sometimes, lines would change, things would shift. And he was just so generous with trying to sort through all that. But we had to find you know, it's not, things couldn't play in one long take often. They had to be a combination of several shots to get through certain scenes so that his best performance didn't get left behind for technical reasons. And I think that was, a, I think for, for Dan and I, sorting that out, because we could see from the very beginning, you had to find whatever Denzel did, whatever you fall in love with, whatever moment there is, then back into that find a way to make that come to life in a way that it, whatever came to life in that performance, be able to make coverage around it so you don't lose it because it's technically a mess or because it doesn't cut or there's some mismatch in some way. So lots of times you don't pay any attention to that. You just live with it. But I, I think we were always on edge a little bit. You just don't want to miss a moment of what he does. You just can't. And uh, I think it was the, one of the greatest joys of working on that movie was watching his process, watching him as an actor go through this sort of remarkable sort of character piece from beginning to end and be able to track the drama. Because, you know, we shoot out of order. Um, so, but uh, I really just found it the most satisfying and interesting part of making the movie. You've worked on a wide variety of films with lots of great directors. What do you look for in a uh, film that you're going to shoot? Um, I really look for a compelling story. <clears throat> and I guess it goes back to all the things that I found most interesting about movies when I fell in love with movies, which is pretty much what I was mentioning before. It was like that storied era of the 60s and 70s when adult drama was the only place you could see adult drama was in the movie theater. And these character, the stories about people in extremis, about human beings in conflict, in relatively 
in, 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 in a world that we all understand and know. And I love that stuff. And I guess that's what I look at. When I read stuff, and it, it really speaks to me when it's about that. When I'm seeing, when I see characters that, that are complicated and flawed in a way that Danny writes them all the time. There are no villains in Dan's movie. Um, there are no horrible people. There's nobody who does anything that isn't exactly what they think is the right thing to do. You're just seeing people bent in different directions because of the internal, the nature of their conflict is all internal. It's all about trying to find the right way to do something and not succeeding. And you know, the name of the, Danny, I remember when he said this to me, he, he loved the name of Roman Israel because it's, it's a name in conflict with itself. The Romans and the Israelis, there they are in, you know, in first century BC, you know, and that's the thing, that's what he writes. He writes about the, the, what goes on inside all of us because we're able, we're one paycheck away or one disastrous event in our lives from walking away from everything we believe in or from being moral or from being honest. Is there anything that could push us into that direction? And, and he says, yes, there is. We're all like that. And so that's what he's interested in. Um, uh, and so that's what I, I love that stuff. And I, I think there's so much more. There's something about reading stuff like that and telling those stories. And it's sadly happening more on cable shows now than it is in the motion pictures, uh, in theatrical release motion pictures anyway, um, because there really isn't the same audience that there was in the 1970s for those movies. There's so many other ways for adults to amuse themselves now such as computers. So, uh, but occasionally they still come up and uh, I'm happy when I get to work on one. And for your work on There Will Be Blood, you won an Oscar. You were also nominated for Good Night and Good Luck. What did that kind of recognition mean for you? Uh, more money. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, uh, you know, it's just, you know, Paul, working for Paul all those years really made me, um, I guess, uh, yeah, I don't know. What, what's the word? You know, you're sort of like um, a little silent. Uh, I don't know. Uh, as Paul would say, you're not a god, you're a demigod. You know? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, where people want to hire you because they love his movies, thinking that I had something to do with it, which isn't true, you know. But that's what happens to cinematographers all the time. Um, you see a movie that they photographed and you imagine somehow they had something. Sometimes they do. Gordon Willis, for instance, I think Owen Roy's. The, the movies that we fell in love with in the 70s are really a reflection in many ways of the changes and the growth in production design and cinematography and editing and all of that. You think of all the stuff that came out of New York in those days and all the great production designers and cinematographers combined with certain directors um, and writers. And it's an, it's an amazing period of time. So yeah, my connection with Paul, uh, certainly uh, Michael Clayton, uh, with Tony Garoy, uh, Danny's brother, and um, and George Clooney doing Good Night and Good Luck and other movies. The, this, the, the way you, you've sort of become sought after, I think, as a cinematographer certainly isn't so much the Academy Award, it's the quality of certain movies. And you, you, make, you, you work on certain kinds of films and they appeal to certain kinds of directors. And those are the people you hear from when they're looking for a cinematographer. That's kind of what happens. Um, and I was lucky that I got early on different sorts of films and I didn't have to do other stuff that wasn't as interesting. And I was very lucky that way. Very lucky. Lucky because of Paul for the most part. Well, Robert Ellsworth, thank you so much. Congratulations on the movie. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.